Um, this light beam is split by two surfaces inherent to the advance of crazed matter. All right, so we think about a crack in this context, and then that crack transitions into a crazed region, and that transitions into the plastic zone. All right, there's two surfaces there um, that are being interrogated by optical interferometry. And so we have an incoming beam, and you are Nick. Nick, okay. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. The scores, uh, the statistics are over there. Um, and uh, we have this light beam coming in and then being reflected out. And the amount and uh, it's reflected out has to do with where the light is on the surface. And you see there's a slight angle here at the bottom of this cray surface and that is causing it to shift from a uh, bleak angle to an acute angle and that gives rise to these types of structures here which we'll be talking about. And so we have a crack out here, which is nothing. All right, so we see zero out there where the crack is. And then where the crazes are, we get information. And that information is based on how stretched out the crazes are, how unloaded they are, and also the angle they make with the bottom surface where the reflection is taking place. And so this is what gives us these types of patterns and um, over here is a solid itself, so not very interesting. So, but this is the basic phenomenon in which we can use optical interferometry to learn things about these structures in real time. So we're looking through the craze, looking at the light bouncing off these surfaces, and also going through these crazed fibular zones and getting information out of that. And part of this has to do with that, that we talked about this before in the context of Maltese cross patterns, this uh, extension of light, all right, and the enhancement of light due to how these wavelengths interact with the solid matter in a polymer sphere light. In this context, it's a little more refined um, because if we take any old light bulb and we have two beams of light coming off of that light bulb and those beams of light hit a mirror and they come back toward each other and if they're in phase, what we do is see these intensifications of the light. And so this is where the light is brighter than it should be because you have wavelengths of light that are overlapping and we visually see that as bright zones. In the context of what's happening in OP, we have a slight uh, displacement of the mirror and today we're actually talking about the surfaces of the polymer that, as the mirror here. And if this displacement is half the wavelength, what happens is these guys overlap and we get nothing. We get darkness. This is destructive. And so this issue of lambda and how it's controlled by the Cray structure is what gives rise to the patterns that we're talking about. These bands of light and dark and the thickness of those bands has to do with the angle that the Cray's interface is making with the incoming light. All right. So it's um, it's an older technique, but you know we learned so much from it, it's still worth talking about. And so we're looking at, to review, this void fibril structure that has a refractive index that is different from that of the bulk polymer because we have these differences in matter now. The polymer is not just sitting there under no strain, it's now under a ton of strain. It's also got all this alignment going on. And so the light comes in, goes through the macromolecules, and it starts bouncing off at different angles. At the same time, it's hitting these crazed areas of matter, and that's causing these changes in the, the wavelength, the overlap of the wavelengths of the, these beams of light. And so what we're looking at is, this is our sigma sub t that we've always talked about. And then uh, we also, where this can become useful as we start to think about fibril rupture, which we'll talk more about here in a minute. All right, but this is kind of the general view of this. Um, this says vacuum. It's not really vacuum. It's maybe lower pressure. And given enough time, it's not even that anymore. Um, but this is kind of the general situation. Light's going through this, reflecting out, and we're looking at these beams, uh, these, these zones of light and dark that correspond to different positions and structures. Okay, so let's look at some data to help us get a better handle on what all this actually shows us.
So we, out here, we've got a crack, and over here we have the crazed matter. And on this, this left-hand version is no load. What does that mean? It means we, we have a crack that has a zone of crazes in front of it, and at one point it was advancing, and the crazes were also advancing and, and failing as well, and then we took all the load off, all right? And so what's happened is we have regions in which we still have crazed matter, all right, these banded structures, and then we have the crack itself where we don't have any crazed matter. We have some collapsed on the, the surface, and you can sort of see that in these patterns. But anyway, this is without load, and then we go to a situation in which we do, do have load. So we've taken this and we've loaded it back up again, all right? And so what happens is these crazes that become much finer because we started to stretch them out, all right? And the, as they've been stretched out, and especially here at this interface with the, the cracked area, you know, they, they become very fine. And as we move away from it, things change. And so the the level uh, or the intensity of the fibril stretching that's going on is proportional to the spacing between these patterns of light and dark. All right, and so with this as a tool, uh, we can start to say, well, what happens if the pressure changes, or the humidity changes, or we add an acetone? We can do all these things and watch what they do to the, these different patterns and understand what these effects have on crazing. So hopefully that all makes sense, but this is the general tool that was really used to help figure things out. And this is an example of just how sensitive this technique is. And this is showing you interference patterns for 0.26 rubber content. Uh, I believe it's PMA. It doesn't say anywhere. But anyways, 0.26% rubber in PMA. And then um, the one below it here is B. And this is A. And this is 2.6. All right, and so we're going to start with A because that's the most interesting one. And so we have this region in which there's, whoops, solid over here. And then we get crazing, and that pattern changes as we move out away. And what we see in the context of having rubber present is you know, these weird little perturbations in that structure. Um, and this is something that hopefully makes some sense to you as that crack is progressing into this and we have a little blob of rubber or various little blobs of rubber here and there. And those blobs of rubber interact with the strain field that's being created by this process of crack advance. Those small areas of rubber, we talked about this in the context of uh, high impact polystyrene last time, they act to relieve stress, all right? So they do what rubber does, they stretch, they take the stress off the polymer itself, and so what happens is we see their presence by these variations in the light and dark pattern. So rather than all the fibrils behaving the same way, some of them are near these small pieces of rubber, and so their lengths start to change. All right, and we see that in these patterns, these optical interferometry patterns. And if we go to 2.6% rubber, we actually lose crazes altogether. Enough rubber and crazes to stop, which should make sense. All right, in order for fibrils to form, all the entanglement and stress has to develop and needs to get really stretched out. But if you add enough rubber, the whole thing becomes soft and all that goes away. And we stop seeing um, that. And in fact, we stop seeing cracks. It starts to deform plastically, all right? And so with this technique, we can look at some relatively localized changes in the microenvironment associated with these cray zones and uh, start to really understand what's going on in these systems. Okay, so observations, and this is where the value is. So again, uh, let's hark back to, I don't know, 1959 or something like that. And we're just understanding polymers and what they do. And so we're looking at this, this new state of matter and this new process called crazing, 
know if it was even called that back then, but anyway, we're concerning ourselves with this process and we're using this technique to examine crazes and what happens when they show up and what happens when we do various things to them or their environment. And so, hopefully this is a review, crazed areas, it was established, partially heal if less, left unstretched for a certain period at room temperature, all right? So this would show up if you let that crack and craze combination sit there for uh, without load and you load it back up again, it goes to a different set of patterns, all right? Meaning that fibrils have been partly destroyed. Uh, wait long enough, they're totally destroyed. Why? Yes? Entropy. Entropy, entropy doing what? Yeah, they'll start, they'll start going from highly lined chains and fibrils, and then they don't like it because entropy, all right? And so they start to unwind and start to go back to being coils and blobs, and you go strain it again, and it's not the same structure than when you stop straining it. It's become very different, and you see that in the optical interferometry. Why don't cracks heal? Yeah? Right, there, there's no entropic driving force driving those interfaces back together again. So you let the crack close, wait, open it, try to strain it again, and it, it's still there, still the same dimensions it was before. There are no entropic drivers, unfortunately. Um, if we could come up with uh, um, crazes in window glass, wow, you know, that would be a game changer. If glass could craze and then heal itself, unfortunately that doesn't happen with glass. <laughs> It tends to crack, and sometimes the cracks keep going. Um, but anyway, but so crazing is something that's characteristic of polymers. And then craze sizes increase up to four times when solvent vapors are present. So you put the PMA under stress, you see the crack advance, you see the occurrence of these crazes in terms of the patterns of light and dark, and then you bring in a beaker of acetone, which does a number on PMA. All right, so you see those crazes change and in this case they elongate. They're four times longer than they used to be. What's going on at the molecular level that makes that happen? What is the acetone doing? What's that? Plasticizing. What is it plasticizing? It's going to plasticize everything, but in particular what is it going to plasticize? The polymer chains what? The polymer chains that are elongating. Yes. All right. Those polymer chains are under strain in the fibrils. All right. They don't like being under strain. And so they're going to have a little bit more affinity for acetone than the rest of the polymer around it because it allows them to relax. It takes off the strain because they've been plasticized. They go back to being lazy and having more configurations and their entropy is higher, meaning that their energy is lower. All right. And this is a common thing in a lot of materials. You put materials under strain, they behave differently than they should. We see this a lot. And then, of course, uh, molecular weight has definite effects on crack width and craze structure. So you guys saw those previous examples of the TEMs and SEMs showing how molecular weight affects the width and the extension. All right, what is that? Why is that so important here? What's going on if we increase the molecular weight from 100,000 to 1.8 million? Chain links are increasing. And so what's becoming more efficient with the increase in chain lengths? Fewer chain ends. Well, there's fewer chain ends. Um, beyond a certain molecular weight, that's not necessarily very important here. But as the chains become longer, yeah? Is it the entangling? Entanglement becomes way more efficient when the chains become longer. All right, they have many more opportunities for the, the fingers to overline, overlap each other, and, and form permanent entanglements, almost like crosslinks. We talked about that before. You can think about them as crosslinks. And if you wanted to fail the entanglement, well, the end is you know, 10 miles away. So you know, the end's not going to help you out. If you wanted to fail them, you might have to cause one decision through the other, which, of course, they don't like to do because it's carbon-carbon bonds, all right? So they just sit there and they hang out and they hold the 
the two edges of the crack together. Um, and the longer they are, the greater the molecular weight, the farther away those crack widths can get from each other. All right, so question. If we went to lower molecular weight plastics, would we expect them to be more or less clays resistant? Why would they be less clays, clays resistant? Less entanglements, yeah. <coughs> so you could see a situation in which crazes form and then fail very quickly, all right? And so in the context of these experiments, you'd have a little bit of crack and a very small craze zone, and then the crack advances, all right? Um, if you increase the, or I'm sorry, decrease the molecular weight even further, you don't get crazing at all. In fact, you don't get cracking at all. You get plastic deformation. So it's like chewing gum. It's like the floor wax out here in the hallway. It doesn't do any of this stuff because they can't form crazes because the molecular weight's too low and the, the ends are only a centimeter away from the other end. Well, not literally, but I mean, it's about 10 miles away. They're very close together and so things can slide past one another and crazes never form at all. Is that good or bad? depends on what you want it to do. When it comes to Florax, it's great. We're not, we're not bearing any load. We fill it full of silica so that it's wear resistant. And we sell it to people and they put it on their tiles and it's supposed to last a long time. All right. It doesn't need to resist crazy. It doesn't not seeing that kind of stress. But if that's you know something's going on the wing of an airplane, well it's not a good idea to have something that weak. And then uh, Hopefully this is something that sounds familiar. What they observed was that crazes grow along transphyrolytic pathways that typically pass through spherulites rather than go around them. So this is borrowing language. So you guys are, are, are familiar with the difference between intergranular fracture and transgranular fracture? Yes? A couple of people have seen this before. All right. And so this is a highlight of uh, crystalline structures that have grains. And it tells you that those grain boundaries are the weak point when you get this intergranular fracture. fracture. The crack finds the weak point and follows it. All right. And if we didn't have grains at all, then materials would be stronger than they are. If oh, I'm sorry. If everything was a huge single crystal, um, then you know they'd be stronger than they actually are. They'd be more flaw sensitive. But anyway. And so in the context of this, if we're looking at these highly crystalline materials, um, they found that they just cut through the spherulite. Now to us, hopefully this is not surprising. Back then, it was like, oh, wow, they're not behaving like grains, because they didn't really understand what spherulites were so much. But now we know that if a crack is cutting through a plastic, there's really no difference between the spherulitic boundary and the middle of the spherulite. All right, remember the change of the strong direction. These are not grains. The boundary is not a weak point. Everything's still connected by polymer chains. All right, and so this shouldn't be a big surprise. Uh, observation, ambient temperature affects the size of the plastic zone required to reach sufficient negative hydrostatic stress for the craze and then the crack to advance. Why is this the case? Why is temperature important? Yes? Uh, higher temperature means the chains are vibrating a lot faster so they can become less tangled it's easier for them to untangle themselves than at a lower temperature? It, it's easier for them to untangle themselves at a higher temperature than a lower temperature. Okay. Um, but this, this has to do with the initial stages. So we're talking about the very beginning of crazing, which has to do with developing a hydrostatic stress. All right. And so if we're at zero degrees Kelvin, are we going to get hydrostatic stress? Heck no, all right? The polymer chains are brittle solids. All we get is, is classic glassy brittle fracture. We don't get any crazing. Uh, we don't get plastic deformation. Everything just fails like glass. If we go up in temperature, then those polymer chains can move around. So if you remember, uh, hopefully this is firmly fixed in your mind, you have the flaw. Uh, at the area around the flaw, the chains pull away from the surface of that flaw, and hydrostatic stress, negative hydrostatic stress develops. All that requires chain motion, all right? And increasing the temperature makes all that motion easier. 
okay? So this should all make sense. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. And then uh, ambient temperature, ambient higher pressures can decrease crazing by suppressing the negative hydrostatic stresses of the critical interfaces. And so this is, you know, where uh, optical interferometry, you know, really shines because you can do things like what I talked about before, apply these really high pressures, and if it's smushing down on the surface that is trying to develop a negative hydrostatic stress, you'll never get a negative hydrostatic stress. But a positive hydrostatic pressure on a negative hydrostatic pressure and it swamps it out. And so if you don't get that negative hydrostatic stressor, hydrostatic stress, you don't get chains moving around, you don't get reorganization, you don't get structural development, you don't get fibrils, you don't get you don't get microvoids, you don't get anything. Right? Because you you've you've eliminated that critical nucleation and growth phenomenon known as hydrostatic stress, to use to use a, a phrase. Um, and so what that means is that high enough pressures can give you ductile fracture. You don't get any grazing at all, all right? Which is uh, not practically very useful, but you know, it's a clear evidence for the, the role of pressure, whether it's positive or negative. Increases in crystallinity reduce the size of the plastic zone. Why is that? What does crystallinity have to do with crazing? move through well the crack moves through the crystals but what's happening at the edges of that structure so what's it what's the what is at the edge of the crazed matter all these fibrils going back and forth and they're connected to what the crazed surface but what is what is happening at that crazed surface yeah There can be either amorphous or crystalline, yeah. And so those fibrils and the, the fact that they lengthen, it's like pulling a rope. You're pulling a rope out of the active zone. That rope is a polymer chains, all right? And you're asking those polymer chains to come out of that active zone. And if the active zone is filled with crystallites, lamella, as part of a spherulite, then that process of pulling out is going to be a lot harder because uh, you're asking those chains to come out of a crystal structure. In order to do that, they need to melt, it takes more energy, therefore it's more difficult for that process to occur. Um, this also enhances the brittle, brittle nature of the polymer. Is that good or bad? I guess that, again, with context, but mostly bad. It's mostly, most, yeah, mostly bad. But yeah, it's context. You know, if asking for something, if I want something that's very rigid, it's not going to deform much, then yeah, having increases in crystalline is a good idea. All right, again, you know, in engineering terms, if the structure deforms by 1%, the plane has crashed. So it depends on what you're asking the material has done. All right, what, what role does it have in these materials and the overall structure? In many cases, we want to be ductile. Okay, and we can also observe these things in three dimensions. Crazes can form ahead of an advancing crack tip. And so this is kind of showing you these uh, cartoons I've been talking about. And so we have all the crazed matter here, and you can't really see it very clearly because light is just not working that way. And then out here we have the crack itself. All right. And so we can see this, we can di directly observe this, and you can see how the crack has interrupted the crazes and caused them to collapse onto the walls. And then if we zoom in, uh, let's see, if we zoom in to this tip area and blow that up, you can start to see that the crack itself is, is not fully two-dimensional. There's areas where it's penetrating further and other areas closer to us in which there are still crazes bridging that area, okay? And so this kind of relates to that uh, SEM of the PVC microstructure I showed you before, where the, 
the crack is penetrating in some places it penetrates further than others all right it may have crazes surrounding it on both sides all right so this is not these are not um, abstract things they're they're real structures and they behave not so ideally all right so keep in mind that a craze and a crack tip especially is a three-dimensional object when crazing is present it represents a plastically deformed zone in front of the crack tip and that we like that in many cases because it keeps the material in one piece when it hits the ground for example all right High stresses <coughs> in the volume surrounding the tip result in a zone experiencing hydrostatic stress and plastic deformation. Fibrils form in this plastic zone. If the applied stress continues to increase, the fibrils elongate and eventually reach the limit of internal stability, and then a crack has, has formed within that crazed material. Um, and this process of elongation um, as far as we know, we typically have failure at the active zone. So for a long time, people always thought that it failed in the middle of the fribble, but it turns out that it actually typically fails where the polymer is supposed to draw out of that active zone. And you come up with a chain end, and suddenly that, that end of the fribble has lost continuity, and the whole thing fails. All right, that's how it's believed to work nowadays. Uh, what is subcritical crack growth? You guys have seen Griffith criterion, a rough idea. What subcritical crack growth is as opposed to regular crack growth? No idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is it like when the like you get small like small cracks forming kind of on the peripherals of the large cracks? Um. No, well, it can happen that way, but so when something fails, so that these windows behind us, you know, if I go out, I bring my hammer and I hit one of them, um, it's going to shatter and make a hell of a mess, and the uh, university won't be very happy with me. But one of the reasons why it shatters is because the crack starts at the tip of the hammer and then it flies all the way across the window pane, right? And that's because of this process of supercritical crack growth where a crack forms and it keeps going. And so in, in terms that the, the folks in this area refer to, they say it, the crack gets better at being a crack as it moves across the window pane. All right, and that's true for glass, which is why it fails so catastrophically. The crack, cracks move at the speed of sound and they just fly all the way through it, releasing energy as they go. All right, and that's characteristic of really brittle materials like glasses a variety of ceramics. On the other hand, we can have situations where, in which we don't have supercritical cracks. We have the growth of flaws, the growth of cracks, but it's happening at a relatively so slow state. And that's what we're talking about with these, these tips having crazed matter. All right, that process is slow. And it should make sense that it's slow because you know crazes take time. We saw that last graph in the last lecture. It took 10 seconds for a craze to appear. All right, so they're not instantaneous things. So under a low enough loading, they will move slowly, and but they'll still move, even though the stress is being applied, and that's what's called a subcritical crack growth, slow-moving cracks. We see that in some uh, classes as well. All right, so as we've hit upon many times before, the craze grows followed by the crack tip. A constant shape of the zone is typically established. All right, so we have crazes that are more or less the same width, they're more or less failing at the same rate, and the crack is progressing through them as time goes by. Failure is complete when this crack spans over the entire cross-section, does not rule out all the other competing crazes in the same polymer sample. So we talk about one craze all the time, or, but in reality, if we go back to our much beloved polystyrene dog bone, and we have this cross-section of the gauge length. We start out, as you should know by now, we start out with flaws. They are inevitable. And some are going to be bigger than others. Uh, let me set it over here. And make it especially obvious and add one there. <coughs> 
So if this is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, which flaw is going to initiate the crazes? Which flaw crazes first? Six, the biggest one. It concentrates the stresses most efficiently, and it's true for polymers as it is for glasses and ceramics. <laughs> the largest flaw fails everything first. In this context, is the first one that starts crazies. So those crazies form, and they move across this, as you saw in that video. And as part of that process, they are Come on. They are bridged by fibrillar matter, all right? And this, uh, I should point out that the size of this thing is not necessarily controlled by the size of the initial flaw. The flaw starts the craze. It doesn't control the size of the craze. That's controlled by other things. And this is a three-dimensional object that bridges across the entire interior as well. So the whole thing is now generated a forest of crazes, all right? And so what is the next flaw to start crazing? Two, the next largest one. All right, the bigger the flaw, the more stress it concentrates, the larger the stresses that are av available for um, fracture at a cracked tip or crazing at a cracked tip in this context. And so the same thing happens there. They form and they run across and they're bridged by fribbles, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there it goes, uh, was it? Six to uh, probably seven next, and then five, three, one, and then maybe four. It's you know, it's kind of, I'm not drawing this to scale, but so you get the point. Uh, the flaw concentrates stress, starts the process, and many, many of these form, and then eventually we are going to see after enough time has passed. And you saw this in the video, which you guys I'm sure have watched half a dozen times now. One of the crazes fails. All right. And so that's the weak point in the structure. Somewhere in that, that craze, there's something that is weaker than all the other crazes, and it l lets things rip open and fail. All right, does that make sense? And it's a crack flying across that particularly weak interface. As has been shown, plenty of evidence exists for this phenomenon in fractured polymer surfaces. A thin film of collapsed fibrils on the fracture surface of PMA uh, this is collapsed craze matter. Why is it collapse? Why, do you, why does it, the aligned structure turn into blobs? Entropy. All right. Entropy at work. Entropy saying, I don't like these aligned polymer chains. The energy is too high. Let's make them unaligned with no stress. That happens instantly, at least at room temperature. Very fast process. All right, and so uh, why do fibrils fail? Um, we talked about the fact that the, there are issues typically at the active zone. Uh, new material can't incorporate indefinitely into these structures, typically because of flaws associated with um, chain ends. Fibril diameter is not truly stable, but narrows due to ongoing creep. All right, that should make sense. You know, these polymers creep at room temperature, and in particular, these structures under all that stress are going to creep. Adjacent to the crack tip the, in the process zone, it's very rapid. Fibrils often fail next to the active zone. So there's a defect that gets introduced from the active zone, and that defect fails it. Stability increases molecular weight due to resistance to disentangling. So that's part of the failure that occurs at the active zone. So all those things should make sense. Um, not surprisingly, based on what you've seen so far, the strength of crazing polymers increases with molecular weight. And so this is just showing you um, stress versus molecular weight. And you can see that for this particular polymer, the breaking stress goes up as a function of molecular weight. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. There's more entanglement, it takes more to fail these things when crazes are present. So molecular weight makes them stronger. Key to this, however, is the fact that the crazing stress is the same. Why is that? Why is the crazing stress always the same, regardless of the, irregardless of molecular weight? Yeah? Because you're going with carbon-carbon bonds and not just the, the length of the polymer 
secondary bond you have? Um, not quite as fundamental as that. What, what is the key nucleating event in crazy? Hydrostatic stress, okay. That's still true here. So what it says in this context is that you know, molecular weight, if it's 1.8 million versus 100,000, yeah, that's, that's important in terms of fibrils, but this, this area in which hydrostatic stress develops is really tiny, all right? And so it doesn't matter what the molecular weight is. Hydrostatic stress is still gonna develop in a very tiny area. Chains are gonna move around. All those things are happening. Whether or not there's chain ends there it does, it doesn't matter, all right? And so this, the crazing stress is always the same because it's really a, a chemical effect. What are the chains doing in terms of how they interact with each other, in terms of how they move past each other, and none of that is dependent on molecular weight, at least above a certain amount. You know, if it's like a molecular weight of 10, then it's different. But, you know, you're at 100,000 versus 1.8 million, you know, the chain ends don't make any difference there. All right. And so again, hopefully this drives home the process and importance of hydrostatic stress development. All right, if stress is sufficiently high to yield craze a polymer, then increase further, fracture can finally occur. Tough samples will undergo extensive plastic flow. We talked about what toughness is already, which dissipates a large amount of energy. Brittle compounds failure occurs much earlier, immediately after strain softening, um, which could make sense. Eventually, however, all these mechanisms are exhausted. Failure conditions are going to be complex in, in polymers. As you've learned, we have both uh, intramolecular and intramolecular van der Waals forces within a polymer coil and between polymer coil and its, and its neighbors. Microstructure could be either amorphous or crystalline, and we know now how important that is. True fracture is complicated and can include both chain sip, slip, uh, slippage and chain scission. So this kind of relates back to things I saw on the test. Don't be qu too quick to talk about chains breaking. All right, Go slow enough and chains will never fracture. They'll just slide past each other to infinity. All right, So um, Balloons breaking, yeah, change of fracturing when a balloon breaks. Why? Because it breaks very quickly. And it also cross-linked, typically, lightly cross-linked. Okay, so change fracture when things happen quickly. But under slow rates, polymer chains may never fracture, right? So carbon-carbon uh, bonds breaking is actually kind of Chain scission can occur in fully extended sequences that are anchored with their ends in chrysolites or other mobile entanglements. All right, and so we can have change fracture when they just can't do anything else. They can cut through each other or they can pull out of a crystallite. Mechanical stress and thermal fluctuations combine to fracture the chain. In spite of these additional toughening mechanisms, it's found that theoretical limits are far from being reached for polymeric materials. As before, flaws or voids are responsible for greatly increasing local stress. I gave you that cartoon a minute ago. Um, being controlled by flaws, the exact reproducibility behavior is never observed and large variations occur. And the best example of that is what's called this volume dependence effect. All right, so if I have a sample that's a millimeter in size and I have a sample that's a, a meter in size, all right, which one has more flaws? The big, one. The big one, all right. It's just bigger, all right. It's going to have more flaws. Which one's more likely to have a strength limiting flaw? Also the big one, all right? It's more, it's big, so it's probably encountered things that may have caused flaws on it, but just statistically speaking, it's more likely to have flaws, even if it's made by the exact same process. And this is why you see things that see, oh, we, we made a, you know, a one by one micron crystal that has the strength of steel, which uh, they've seen for polyethylene. You know, polyethylene by itself as a single crystal is tremendously strong, but they also don't have any flaws, <laughs> all right? So a flaw-free single crystal polyethylene is pretty darn strong, all right? But you make something real, it's full of flaws, all that goes out the window. You can't brag about it being um, the strength of steel. And so in order to not drive ourselves crazy in the laboratory, we deliberately introduce flaws and look at fracture, all right? So that we don't rely on occurring distributions. And so this is all brittle fracture discussions, which hopefully you guys have seen previously. So we have a flaw of width 2c and it advances by delta c through a sample that's d thick all right and so it starts at 2c and then it grows all right and crazy may be occurring as it grows but in applying stress or fracture starts at the two edges 
And this criterion, um, if you're used to seeing Griffith criterion, it's usually applied to glass or some very brittle materials. Um, plastics, it still applies. It's not as ideal, and we'll talk about why. Um, Griffith criterion are of a general nature and can be applied to polymers after some modifications. Thickness is D, Young's modulus E, um, and it's an infinitely large plate, which is what we always assume when we talk about rotor fracture. We can calculate a decrease in the elastic free energy on the plate. All right, and so this becomes important. This is why cracks fly through glass at the speed of sound, because of the relief of the elastic free energy in the system. So this delta F is equal to pi C, that, that uh, thickness of the width, the applied stress, modulus D, the thickness, and then delta 2C. As we're the increase in crack length produces additional surfaces to creation requires a certain amount of work. We're making gamma, all right? That has a cost. Gamma has a cost. It has a surface energy of whatever it is, joules per square centimeter. All right, that wasn't there before, and somebody has to pay for it. So we do work on the system to create gamma. And as you'll see, the meaning of gamma has to be modified for polymers quite a bit. But for just general brittle solids, we have this condition for fracture. And as part of that, we have this process of strain energy release rate gamma sub 1. So again, why glass fractures like it does? There's an energy release rate associated with the presence and motion of that crack. And this is why, as they say, cracks get better as they move because they release more and more and more energy. In glass, it is. And so this is equal to this delta F term divided by D delta 2C. And again, this is equal to that prior combination of modulus and stress. This provides the work needed to create the new surface, at least in glass it does. And the crack advances when it reaches the meets the Griffith's fracture criterion where G is greater than 2 gamma, all right? So we're, we're providing the energy for gamma to occur, and we talk about this G1C as being that critical value. And this, the use of 1 indicates what's called crack opening mode to distinguish it from shear, which is the one they worry about that becomes 2. So we just talk about 1 where it's just pure tension. And then one of the key things that if you haven't already committed it to memory, I want you to commit this to memory. The stress required to make a, a solid that is a Griffith solid fail is equal to 2 times the modulus times gamma again, that surface energy, divided by pi, which is always a constant, divided by C, all right? And C is the flaw size. All right, which is why in real materials we like to try to minimize the flaw size as much as possible because if we do that, then the stress that can survive goes up dramatically. All right, hopefully you can see that here. So this is something that, when you think about brittle materials, this should come to mind. Um, so the applied stress sets the stability limit for that crack. For tensile stress and validity limit, the crack maintains a constant length, 2C. It doesn't grow. There's a flaw. There's stress, but it's not growing. Above that applied stress, that crack does grow and south. So, um, yeah, I'll just skip to the end here because we're running out of time. For polymers, the work required for the formation of a surface during fracture is dominated by the preceding plastic flow. This gives rise to observed rate dependence for gamma, and if we get gamma from a fracture experiment, it's much larger for polymers than experimentally determined by wetting angle measurements. We can figure out what gamma is by doing the, the Young-Dupree wetting angle, where you have a drop sitting on the surface that tells you what gamma is. Um, we measure it for PMA as being 0.1 joules per square meter, but the mechanics of it, if we fracture it, it's 100 to 1,000. And that represents the plastic deformation. And in particular, it represents crazing. All right, so PMA doesn't fracture as it should based on a simple measurement of gamma on the solid surface of PMA. It, ma it fractures at a much higher effective gamma because that gamma now has to account for all that plastic deformation, which window glass does not do. Right. This, this calculation works great for window glass. It's crappy for PMA. All right, any quick questions on that? If not, I'll see you guys on Monday, right? Okay.